I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. I mentioned in a previous episode of the show with Scott Pyburn that I had participated in an annual zine fest here recently called Print and Resist. Now, I'd done craft shows and art pop-ups before, but this was my first ever zine fest. I was pretty excited about it. Emily Mayer from Minneapolis, who I had met last season on the show, she was there too. One of the people that Emily and I had talked about on that episode was an artist that also had a table at the zine fest. My name's John Porcelino, and I draw a comic zine called King Cat Comics. And I also run a distribution company for a small press and self-published comics called Spit in a Hat. John has been doing this for years now. His zine is actually one of the longest published mini-comics in existence. So I had gone over to John's table to introduce myself, and I blurted out that I had this podcast and I would love to talk with him. We exchanged information, and he was nice enough to talk with me a few weeks later on Facebook Messenger. He's actually living here in Wisconsin in the city of Beloit, so I thought I would ask him about that first. One thing I really want to ask, being a person from Wisconsin, why did you move to Beloit? You didn't live there originally, right? Uh, no, it. I ended up in Beloit by almost total coincidence. I'm from Chicago, and I grew up in around Chicago most of my life. In the early 90s, I moved out to Denver, Colorado, kind of on a whim, just so I, to start my distribution company because it was it was so cheap to live there at the time. Really? And then I ended up kind of living all over the country over the course of the next 20 years. So I got to a point in my life, I think I was 42 or so, where I knew I wanted to live back in the Midwest, but I wasn't really sure where or how to make that happen. At the time, my mom was living in Rockton, Illinois, mm -hmm. which is just, you know, right up here by the border. And so I kind of ended up, I moved to South Beloit, Illinois, just because I didn't know what else to do. And it was cheap. And I found an apartment where the landlord didn't make me fill out an application or, <laughs> you know, give first and last month's deposit. I basically put $400 on the table and moved in that night. So um, I kind of thought I'd probably be there for six months. I talked him into doing a six month lease and I kind of figured I'd be there for six months. And then hopefully by the end of that six months, I would have figured out something more permanent. Just right about at the end of that six months, I met my girlfriend, Stephanie, who lived across the border. So long story short is I ended up moving in with her and I've been here ever since. Well, that uh, actually turns into a nice just, little love story. Uh, sure. No, it, it, it is a, a little cosmic that we ended up finding each other. And like I met, kind of mentioned, when I moved to South Beloit, it was probably the lowest point in my life. Like I was completely broke. I had been mm -hmm. divorced twice. I would basically run out of affordable places to live as a cartoonist. And I didn't really know what I was going to do. You know, and of course, I moved to South Beloit, Illinois, which your listeners may or may not be familiar with. But it's it's not the most cheerful town yeah especially like in late november which is when i moved there so i like moved there right in the most gray miserable part of it and it was also this was 2010 it was about the the low point i think of the whole economic crisis and stuff too so it, mm. it was a it was pretty depressed economically it just seemed like it seemed like emotionally too but being good illinoisan I really couldn't bring myself to move to Wisconsin, even though I knew Beloit was a lot nicer than South Beloit. So um, I found this place in South Beloit. And, you know, I, like I said, I really did not think I would be here nine years later. You know, once I kind of got used to it and over the culture shock and stuff, it's a cheap place to live. It's relatively peaceful, centrally located. It's easy for me to get from here to Madison or Chicago or Milwaukee or lots of places, honestly, in the Midwest, and then still have kind of a affordable, comfortable home base to go back to. When people ask about it, I usually say, I live as close to Chicago as I can afford to. <laughs> <laughs> Running his own publishing company all these years, Spit and a Half, I've always wondered how people get started that way and how to really do something like that in general. So when you first started doing it, like what was the reasoning behind it? Well, I mean, it was just, um, this was the early 90s. 
I graduated from college in 1990 with a painting degree. So consequently, I worked in factories and stuff post-graduation. Uh, I drove a forklift and worked on assembly lines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And what had happened was a old friend of mine had moved out to Denver. He had just gotten a job transfer and he was trying to talk me into coming out there. I, I went out to visit him and I saw what a beautiful city it was. And like I mentioned earlier, it mostly it was just, it was so dirt cheap to live there. It was, Denver's a very boomer bust type of economic city. It, it, it goes in big waves. Not so much anymore, but at that time, definitely. And this was like, I guess they'd had a big oil crash at the end of the 80s. So it, oh. it was just, it was, people had fled Denver. And so it was super cheap to live there. And it's beautiful. The city's a wonderful city. And so when I went out there to visit, I saw an opportunity to try to put myself in a situation where I can live more independently. And so at the time, there was the kind of, early inklings of what kind what kind of became known as indie rock so there were mm -hmm. a lot of kind of weird bands tiny labels and there were a couple record labels uh, there was ajax records in chicago and then k yeah. records in olympia washington that they were record labels for this kind of underground music of the time but they also they also distributed other labels or like people who put out their own records and stuff so i was kind of involved in that scene a little bit and it occurred to me i'd always been drawing comics and doing zines since my teen years and it occurred to me i i knew so many people who were doing really interesting comics or self-published other projects and things like that to do something similar to what maybe k or ajax was doing with records but to do it for zines and comics and so that was kind of my inspiration and when i moved out to denver it was like you know i it's so cheap to live here that i could uh this is my shot to try to get something going okay. along those lines yeah and so uh that was that was my impetus for doing it i mean mostly you know my whole adult life has been a process of trying to figure out how do I sustain myself, yeah. my own work as an artist. That's exactly why I ask. You've been doing it for quite some time, so something must be working. I mean, I'm sure it's not as everything's been great since then. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the ironic thing with the distro at this point is that I, I, mean, I started in 1992, and then for health reasons, I took about a, a 10 years off. So I restarted the distro about 10 years ago. And the ironic thing with it is it's so successful that I just can't keep it going anymore. What? So uh, it's it's more than a full-time job oh. at this point to to do the work that is required to maintain this enterprise. And my initial goal with it was that it would be some kind of part-time job that I could do in alongside my own personal creative work. Just over time, it's... The, the balance is way out of whack and I'm getting older. I want more time to be able to work, to do my own work. At its peak, Spit and a Half kept in stock about a thousand titles. I mean, this is just in a spare room in our house. A couple of years ago, I, I finally got a storage unit for um, some of the larger amounts of back stock and things like that. So it's a completely one man operation and at its peak, a year ago or so, I was mostly, I was typically working six and a half days a week. I usually took Saturday afternoons off. Were um, you printing these yourself too, or were they sent to you? I mean, no, and that's a big misconception, especially at shows. People come up and they're like, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff. I self published my own work and I have done a few publishing projects for other artists um, under the Spit and Half banner, but mostly I, I just distribute these books. Okay. So I, I arrange to get copies from small presses or little independent book publishers. But in a lot of it is is people who self publish, you know, mm, okay. self publish their comics. Yeah. So I take the stuff on and sell it for them. And then I take a small cut. You know, one of the reasons I started it too, was that a lot of people, a lot of artists don't like doing that stuff. They like drawing and putting the books out and they don't really want to have to go to the post office every day or 
put stuff in envelopes and, and mail it, which, you know, I kind of understand. But for me, having come out of the zine world, it was, it was just kind of part and parcel of the way I thought about how you do this kind of work. Yeah. And so because of my own comics, because of King Cat, I basically am going to the post office every day and filling orders every day and stuff. For me to take on the work of some friends and peers and stuff and try to help them out by taking that load off them and then get, you know, it's a job, but it, it made sense for me to do that. I mean, it's still something that I still get a thrill every time I get an order. I, oh, I go yeah. to the post office every day and I love throwing the big stack of fulfilled orders on the counter and watching them go out in the world. But it just, you know, the older I've gotten, my health is, it has been iffy for quite a while. And I just don't have the steam that I used to have when I was 25 years old or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, in order to keep up with it. And so I'm sure I will always do the distro to some degree or another, because it's something that I really do truly enjoy, but yeah. it needs at this point to get back to that original goal of something that I could do a, a couple of days a week and make a little bit of extra money and, you know, have the fulfillment that I get from working to help other cartoonists who I really love, but still have the time to do my own work. That is what I really worry about, having the time to do what I want. That's why I'm trying to figure out a way to cut my usual go-to, which is freelancing. Because I know when I do that, that is what I'm going to end up thinking about instead of working on things I really want to make. John's main thing he's known for, the King Cat comics themselves, how did he decide to create that type of thing in the first place? What kind of clicked for you on that one that, you, that you've been doing it for so long? So when I first started doing zines, mostly I worked with like a small group of friends and stuff, and we would kind of co-edit little magazines. When I got to college, I started a little art and poetry magazine called Kosoiko, where I would collect work from people. And, you know, in the zine community, that's an international group of people. I would collect work, poetry or short stories or photography, drawings, comics and stuff, and I'd assemble this magazine. Early 1989 is when... I wanted to do a new magazine that would just be all my own stuff. And that was mostly inspired by this cartoonist, Julie Dusay from Montreal, who hmm. did a zine called Dirty Plot. And something about Dirty Plot just really struck me, the way it was really personal. Like everything in it had her kind of creative stamp on it. Doing an anthology is great, but it is a little bit difficult wrangling people. And yeah getting work and dealing with people's bruised egos and problems and stuff like that. And so I started King Cat in May of 89, just to have that kind of personal outlet as well. And, and really rapidly after I started King Cat, my other zine projects kind of went by the wayside. Cause once I got a mm. taste of doing this thing just by myself it was a, a relief and you know, also really early on with King Cat, I realized just the nature of what I was interested in the way I wanted to do this work was that it was the kind of thing that it just kind of was this shell that I could fill with whatever was going on at the time in my life. Mm -hmm. And and early on, it was, King Cat was a range of different kind of things. There'd be fiction stories and just kind of essays and drawings and autobiographical stories and things like that. And over time, it skewed more and more to straight autobiography. And so there was a point where I just realized this, I could keep this going the rest of my life because there's no inherent limitation right. in, in this. Like as, as I change, as I grow older and my life changes and my sensibilities change, King Cat can change along with it. You know, I'm not going to run out of space. As long as I keep staying alive and keep making work, this can be a home for that. You know, I don't think I thought of it really super consciously at first, but I, I do think there was a certain point where I kind of realized that I had something that could uh, just kind of move through life alongside of me. Mm -hmm. And so that became kind of a source of, creative security or or just you know it was it was just like okay this is what i have this is i made this thing to be a home to my life but writing personal comics biographical comics can be really hard especially if you just 
put everything out there. How did you get past being personal? Like when you realize people are reading it, how much do you realize like, oh crap, I don't really want to tell people about that. Well, how do you get past that? I, I mean, I, I can tell, I can tell you specifically it was issue number 44, which was five years into my run on King cat and mm -hmm. some friends of mine did a West coast road trip. We were all zine people and comics people. We went up the coast from the Bay Area up to Vancouver, Canada, and back down. And at the time, uh, Seattle was, was kind of the, the epicenter of what became known as alternative comics. Fantagraphics was there, mm -hmm. and it was kind of the grunge era. And there was just there was a ton of cartoonists there and so because of the zine world and stuff you know a lot of people through the mail but especially back then you don't not meet people in person for many years or even ever so i remember my friends and i going up to seattle in particular and you know we were there for like a week or something and of course it ended up hanging out with cartoonists and maybe because it was a more social kind of scene and there was just a lot more happening but it became clear that these cartoonists to some degree or another took it pretty seriously mm. you know they were watching what other people were doing and i don't i don't even i don't mean competitively but just in a way of like learning from each other working alongside each other mm -hmm. maybe to a certain extent like oh look what this person did you know i want to snag some of that for my own work but it, it was like they they had a weekly meeting on wednesday nights at somebody's apartment where they'd get together and show each other the work they, they were doing so for my friends and i who are on this trip who are all like good midwesterners who you know are very reticent to share anything with anyone and kind of keep to ourselves and are a little bit suspicious of groups of people personally i can say going up there and and meeting those people was a real turning point for me because I realized not only that these people were taking it seriously, but these people were like taking my work seriously. Hmm. I remember coming back from that trip and sitting down to work on the next issue, King Cat, and being gripped by this sense of self-awareness for the first time in 44 issues of this had better be good because there's people who are talented who are going to read this and they're going to mm. make some kind of judgment about it, whether it's good or bad. And there's publishers out there maybe who are kind of sniffing around these cartoonists. And, you know, I respect these people, so I want them to respect me. You got stage fright, kind of. Sort of, yeah. yeah. Huh. You know, I, I mean, it it didn't stop me from making comics, but it was an eerie feeling almost to have that kind of sense fall over me. And in, in, I mean, really looking back, I just feel very lucky that I had that extended period of time where I just, it's not even like I was ignoring that because it, I just wasn't even aware yeah. that people would take this kind of stuff that seriously or respectfully that what there was a real kind of hinge there at that very moment where I became aware that there was an audience. This isn't an uncommon story. Like, why do artists choose to do personal versions of creative things and put it out there? Why do why do we do that? Do you? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I and this this is something that took me a long time to kind of figure out because it certainly wasn't anything conscious. Mm -hmm. I just think for me, at least, you know, for me, I was always a creative person. I was, as long as I can remember my earliest memories, I was writing and I was drawing and I was making little books and sticking them in my drawer and never showing them to anybody. And eventually through the zine community, through photocopying, I found a way to share that stuff with people. And so like I, I was very socially backwards. I was very insecure. I was 
very awkward, I feel like, in social situations in which I felt intimidated or uncomfortable. And it was through making zines, making comics and making zines of them, that I found a way to connect with people in a way that felt comfortable to me. It took me a long time to think about it in that way, but I'm sure that that's what my motivation mm -hmm. was. I have all this stuff inside me that I want to share somehow. But the normal ways that people share those things seem really impossible to me. Mm -hmm. So how can I how can I put this stuff out? How can I tell these stories or share these ideas in a way that I feel comfortable with? And I think for me, you know, and it probably happens for a lot of people in different ways. For me, it was making zines and and then ultimately making comics. As to why I it, the stuff is so personal, I, I can just only say that I was always interested in real life. I, I can't read fiction. When I read fiction, all I do is I sit and pick it apart as a writer and I think, okay, <laughs> now this is a writer writing these words and they're making these literary choices to try and get this emotional point across or whatever. I read biographies, autobiographies, history, stuff like okay. that. And so it's just natural that my own work gravitated that way just my my own life and trying to understand my own life has been my main motivation as a human being and as an artist i guess it just carries over into that see i feel like i missed out on the zine thing because when i was in high school and people were making them i was always under the impression like they were always poetry and i know you've done some poetry <laughs> too but i'm just like if i would have known that i could have done comics i feel like i would have I feel artistically, I would have grown a lot more up until now. Like I only recently discovered like, oh, you can do comics in them. And, and essentially I was making what my friends and I called mini comics, but we yeah. wouldn't share them with the same people. I didn't realize that they could have been intertwined that whole time. And I feel kind of jilted because of that, yeah. you know? <laughs> I, I mean, I do, I do feel lucky that I got involved in the zine world early enough on where and this is one of the things that i miss a lot about it and that i'm always trying to find ways to alleviate this but you know when i first started doing zines um like i mentioned i mostly did these anthologies art and poetry magazines or things like that when you traded when you got involved in the zine world i would trade my early king cats for mag for political zines Okay. or for poetry zines, or for like science zines. To me, that was the amazing thing about the zine world. One of the amazing things about it was uh, the absolute breadth and depth of the stuff that people are self-publishing about. And so in the early days, it wasn't so like, okay, comics go over here, poetry goes over right. here cooking zines go over here, whatever, you know, music zines go over here. There was a little bit of everything and people were very open to cross pollinating between those focuses. The zine, it was a huge education for me getting involved in that world because, you know, it was just like, you get all kinds of surprising things in the mail. Yeah. Things weren't in these little ruts like they are now and in some ways like you know we met at the print resist festival so like i'm a cartoonist and i love comics mm -hmm. but really it's very clear to me like i'm a zine person and still one of the things i'll say not to put down comic shows i think you know they're a lot of fun and stuff but at, when i go to zine shows there is a different feel at those shows versus a comic show oh, no yeah. matter how uh, progressive or artistically or literary focused the comic show is and it's just because there's such a variety of work at a zine yes. show. In my experience, people who go to the zine shows, whether they're tabling or as attendees, are interested in a broader range of expression than just comics. At comic shows, a lot of times, especially doing the distro, where I'll have like 100 different books on the table, people will come up and be like, oh, I'm looking for this, this, and this, which is fine. Because a lot of these, these comics are really hard to find. So when I table at a show, people are able to find stuff that they may have only heard about. At a zine show, there's much more of a sense of people will come to my table not knowing what they're looking for. And kind of ask a lot of questions and pick up a lot of things and flip through them. They go there um, knowing what the concept the is. Yeah, and there's, there's, a, there's a real openness and a curiosity 
uh, that's inherent, I think, to that community, the, the zine community. That is just refreshing to me. And, and really, that's what gets me jazzed up about this, this whole thing. Yeah. Is, is that connection that you make with people who are curious and smart and interested in a lot of things and interested in communicating about a lot of things. And so, you know, that's why even today, I, I mean, I, it's very clear to me, King Cat is a zine and I'm a zine person. It's comics. Yeah. So I have my foot in that world as well. I wrote down this next part before we started, so I would remember to mention it to John because I thought it was a funny coincidence. When I first went to uh, reach out to you to uh, follow up after I'd talked to you about talking on this show, I went to your Instagram page and you took a picture at Zine Fest and my son's head walked right in front of the picture oh. where you were taking it. So you have a picture where there's a kid with a pink mohawk that walked right in front of oh, one of you. Oh, yeah. That's my son. <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, that's wonderful. I... I, I was just trying to take pictures to post later and i was in that room just kind of held my camera up uh, click 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 uh -huh. when i looked back through the photo scroll or whatever it is i was like oh well that's perfect <laughs> <laughs> the, the blurry pink mohawk uh, obscuring the room full of people with their crazy zines this yeah is, that's exactly what I, I couldn't i couldn't ask for a better uh better image than that that's funny that's great and it was his first exposure to a zine fest i'm a comic collector so i have like tons of them and he grew up around like collectible toys and comics and just rooms of you know long boxes and stuff like that but he had never been to the zine fest thing before and i had known about it so i brought him to it and it really spoke to him and he just thought the whole thing was cool. And I'm like, have I really never told you about zines before? <laughs> and I felt kind of bad. I'm like, oh, I'm a bad parent. So that's why when I saw him yeah. in that picture, I'm like, that kind of sums up for him too what it was because it really spoke to him. I wanted to know after that what grabbed him about zine fests over the years or how to explain the difference between those and Comic Cons to people. FYI, I enjoy both, but they really are so very different. So for me, in the early 80s, back when the Chicago Comic Con was still this like little rundown dingy thing at the Congress Hotel on Michigan Avenue, I used to go down there and there was this one guy from Southern Illinois, I think his name was Chris Duffy. He kind of did what I'm doing with Spit and a Half. Okay. So he had a table and it was all obscure, weird, freaky comics art so he would hmm. he had like if you can picture like he would have some of the original raw magazines like gary panner zines and comics okay. uh, uh or early linda berry stuff weird mail art and like art zines and things like that and it was pretty hardcore you know and he was surrounded by you know guys with their superhero stuff or whatever and i would go to that show and I would just go straight to this guy's table every time. It was, you know, I had my mind blown to this guy's table and I never knew what he was going to have or what to expect. Huh. And so there was, there was a period for me personally where I took that kind of point of view, like with Spit and a Half, if I can be that guy who's here at the superhero show <laughs> and some dude comes, somebody comes by and sees my table and it, and has their mind blown the way I did when I was, what, 14 or how old I was at, the, at this Chicago Comic Con. Yeah. To be exposed to the, you know, like, guess what? Comics is this huge, sprawling, complex world. So I kind of took, I kind of got jazzed about that feeling. If I can be that guy that Chris Duffy was for me when I was 14 that changed my life, that's a pretty good thing to be. But it, it, it just, it's it's too hard <laughs> I, I i don't have the, the uh, emotional stamina to do those kind of shows anymore it's it's just it breaks my heart to have a table with a hundred of the best comics from all over the world and just see people's eyes glaze over because they don't recognize any right of it, you know and and people not even stop or or make eye contact or ask a question or anything um mm -hmm. and so um you know i it's been a while since I did those shows, but there was a period where I felt like, you know, I was a emissary or a missionary going out in that world of mainstream yeah. comics and, and putting this stuff in front of people. But 
it's it's a little heartbreaking too over time. Yeah, but you never know. It's it's one of those things where what if it's a if I can just reach one person, like you never know how they're gonna, you're going to change their life. Oh, I'm mean, sure, sure, and for you know, definitely, I mean, for a long time, I had that point of view, but at a certain point, it was like I just spent an entire weekend of my life being dismissed yeah. by thousands of people they'll find it if they need to find it maybe it doesn't have to be me sitting behind this table and wishing i was dead <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sad trust trust me it gets very sad very fast what is the defining moment that made john create a comic that he's done all of these years what were some of the first things that you were interested in I was born in 68, so probably by 73 or so I was reading, and my dad would bring home the Sun-Times, Chicago Sun-Times, which I think about it, and it's, it says something about my brain, I think, because the Tribune, you know, the, it was the Tribune versus Sun-Times, and the Tribune, I mean, famously, Tribune Syndicate or whatever, they had, like, all the great classic right. comic strips, right? They had Little Orphan Annie, they had Peanuts, they had Dick Tracy, they had High and Lois, they had whatever. You know, and so the Sun Times had like Funky Winker Bean, mm -hmm. a Ziggy, uh, you know, Miss Peach, stuff like that. I, I read everything. I read the newspaper cover cover, but you know, I loved the comics because I love drawing. I, I read what were kind of like probably, realistically speaking, kind of the second tier <laughs> comics of the 1970s. You yeah. Know? Why would he bring home the Sun Times instead of the Tribune? The Sun Times was kind of the people's paper, right? Okay. So it's kind of like the Tribune was the establishment, probably a little more staid, conservative. Um, the other thing with the Sun Times was it was uh, it's more like a magazine size, so you like it's easier to read on the train versus oh. having like this massive piece of newsprint held in front of you. I don't I don't know why. Huh? I don't know why it was the Sun Times and not the Trib. But, Again, it's um, one of those things where it's like, yeah, that kind of may have steered you in a certain direction because of that. I mean, but even sure. even as a yeah, kid, yeah. you were reading you know, the alternative paper. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, and my dad was not a particularly political person. Yeah. Uh, there may have been some kind of working class politics involved in it some somehow. Or it may have just been simply it was easier to read on the, on the train on the way home. When I was young, I really was not a comic book person at all. Looking back, I'm also kind of grateful of because a lot of my friends who grew up with like superhero comics and stuff like that, like they learned how to draw comics the Marvel way, for right. instance. And so they they kind of had to unlearn that stuff. Whereas for me, I didn't have any of that. To, for me, like, well, comics could be Ziggy or they could be Apartment 3G or they could be, mm -hmm. you know, I had a couple Superman comics or whatever. I had a couple like monster comics so they could be like, monster horror stories or they mm. could be they could be anything and that was like really clear to me from the beginning so i didn't have any particular like tunnel vision about comics it was from the very beginning it was it could be whatever you you wanted now um, you're in the reader and you're doing curry pothole the reader was huge for me too because about the time i was a early teen that's when i started getting into underground culture and art movies and and fine art and weirder stuff and underground music and stuff so my dad by that point we were living in the suburbs and my dad would bring home the reader for me every week and hmm. so that was a huge educate like a huge cultural education for me it was it was such a precious thing to get the reader every thursday or whatever it was that he, he'd bring it home and you know in the back in the classified section, they had their their comics. There were quite, there were a few of them that would kind of come and go, but the big ones for me was Ernie Pook's comic by Linda Berry, and then Life yeah. in Hell by Matt Groening. You know, those were the two comics that really were the like blast that went off in my brain. That was like, I can draw comics and say interesting things in them. Yeah. And they don't have to look like this or that or whatever. They can be funny and they can be kind of serious at the same time or and they can be sardonic and they can also be like very emotionally honest at the same time. And and so it was really it was those two cartoonists that I found in the reader when I was like a I don't know, 13 or 14 or whatever. You know, I always drew comics as a kid, but I started thinking about comics as another tool in my creative arsenal. You know, I was playing in, 
punk bands and painting and writing and comics became another way to express myself alongside all those other forms. And it primarily came down to those two cartoonists, Matt, Matt Groening and, and Linda Berry. But in some ways, what I ended up doing with comics was kind of Linda's literary memory based approach to storytelling coupled with Matt Groening's, you know, super fine line, minimalist drawing style. And that wasn't ever really intentional. It was something looking back on it. I, I think it's kind of funny that those were the two because I, I think it, it does actually show in my work to this day. I had a very similar thing with Linda Berry, kind of a thing that made me go again. Yeah. Like you said, you could do this. I was at the YMCA here uh, after swim lessons or something when I was a kid. I was waiting for my parents to pick, pick me up. And there was an issue of one of the local independent newspapers called the Isthmus. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. the back, in the classifieds, there was a cartoon by Linda Berry. And I remember looking mm -hmm. at it. And first of all, it was just... It was all these words and then just like a crudely drawn girl, you know, and like her face yeah. is just surrounded by what she's saying. And I'm like, what's this? And I started reading it. And then afterwards, I'm like, what did I just read? What's going on here? Sure. And I, it, it was one of those things where like my mind didn't know what was happening, but I knew it was a comic and I knew that I just enjoyed it. But I'm like, how does this work? How is, how is, you know, it right. was, I had so many questions by the exposure that just happened in my head. And I still remem remember to this day oh. having that experience, just like I, I read mm -hmm. it like several times because I was, I couldn't comprehend what happened. Mm -hmm. It was, it was weird, but in a good way. Yeah. And, and also sure. I think a lot had to do with the fact that I was sitting there by myself and it, I think it added to the independence of this discovery. You know, it's just the whole thing. The experience sure. all together was very interesting. Something that is speaking to you in a way that maybe isn't speaking to everybody yeah. in that moment. Back around the time I was recording season three of this show, I had actually reached out to Linda Berry because she teaches at the university right here in Madison. And I'm pretty sure that I emailed that exact story I just told. And she even responded to me. She said to me, I'm teaching finals right now and I am here until four. You should come by. And I couldn't believe it. But I was actually on my way to talk to another person for the show, so I asked if we could reschedule. But she was done with classes for the summer after that, so she didn't get my messages until the next semester. And by then, I felt like I had already kind of sent too many messages and didn't want to come off like a crazy person. So sadly, we never got to meet. But look at it this way. I'd only gone to the Zine Fest the year before and didn't have the guts to ask John if he would want to talk. And this year, I was actually in the show, and I just went over and asked. You can find out more about John and all the stuff that he's up to on his website, spitandahalf.com. If you're enjoying the podcast, head over to my site, AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list or find all the links to the other things that I'm on. Or if you have any questions or would like to contact me, just head over to the website. That's AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for this show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. So thanks for listening. And until the next episode, so long.